ladies and gentlemen. We'll go ahead and get started with our next group. And they are going to talk to us and share some insights on procedural learning. And yes, there's some exciting activities on your table, you can tell. So let me go ahead and introduce Susie Dean, Marcus Nicholas, and VJ Submarania. So thank you all very much for coming and being here to present to us today. Just so you know where we're from, I'm Susie Dean from Healthcare Professions Nursing. VJ Subramanian with Mathematics Division. Marcus Nicholas, Communication and Humanities. All right, procedural learning, ladies and gentlemen. So, procedural learning is a set of processes associated with practice and experience leading to relatively permanent changes in the capability for responding. And the way we kind of broke up our presentation today is to kind of subdivide the definition. So we'll start with a set of processes associated with practice and experience. Susie, in her demonstration, will, um, will example various, uh, various uh, exposures and practices um, in, the, in her specific task. The second part, leading to relatively permanent changes in the capability for responding, we're going to associate that with understanding. And that's what VJ will example in his um, particular uh, guitar demonstration that he's going to do. He's also going to address the neuroscience of under complete, understandings, complete understandings versus incomplete understandings. We also discovered in our research that there's, a two, part, there's two major parts to learn the learning equation. We have the curriculum or the information, as well as the approach um, and the teaching methods. And we'll capstone it with the responsibilities both of the teacher and the student. In order to demonstrate procedural learning, I thought we could do a task together. There are some supplies on your tables. There's a Ziploc bag with colored rubber bands with special significance as far as color is concerned. <laughs> and there's a set of instructions as well. If you will just look up here for just a moment. This is my daughter, Olivia Dean, who taught me how to do this rubber band looming. And she's going to give us a video demonstration on how to make a rubber band ring, which is what we're going to make today. This is Sierra Olivia Dean, and today I'm going to teach you how to make a rubber band. For your bottom rubber band, eight, you're just going to twist it, and then you're going to have your two rubber bands just smooth. You're going to take the bottom one on either finger, and you're going to cross it over like this. You want to make sure you have three rubber bands on your finger at all times. You're going to keep crossing it over and continue until you get your desired length. Like this, when you get your desired length, you're going to cross the bottom one over so you're only going to have two left. You're going to pull them off your fingers and you're, con you're going to connect this. So to connect your seed clip, this is what your rubber band ring looks like. <laughs> okay, so based on that video by a 12-year-old girl, do you feel like you can begin to make your rubber band yes. ring? No. Nope. No. Okay, so you can imagine how our students feel after only one exposure to a specific skill set. So I'm going to go ahead and let you look at your handouts, and I'm going to walk you through the instructions to make a rubber band ring. Okay, so we're going to start with a color pattern of blue, then yellow, and then white. So if you want to go ahead and take your rubber bands out and start with the blue rubber band, the very first step in the process is to take the blue rubber band and put it on your index and middle finger in a figure eight pattern, just like this. So a figure eight pattern. BJ and Marcus will walk around to help you. 
The next step in the process is to put on the yellow band, just straight across your fingers. Do not put it in a figure eight bag pattern. Next, you're going to take the white rubber band and put it straight across your fingers. So you should have it in the order of blue and a figure eight, then yellow, and then white. I lost my is everybody there? Once you're there, you're going to take the bottom rubber band. In this case, it should be your blue rubber band. You're going to grab it on either side and bring it to the middle. So pull it from the sides and bring it to the middle. Pull it from the side and bring it to the middle. At this point, the blue one has moved to the middle and it has started your ring. So you need to keep three rubber bands on your fingers at all times, so you need to know that you need to add a blue at this point. Straight across? Straight across. No more figure eights, just straight across. Adjust your bands down and add a blue one across the top. <laughs> now your yellow band should be on the bottom. And you want to bring the yellow band over your fingers and into the middle. <laughs> now adjust the rubber bands down on your finger. So now you keep repeating this pattern of looping over the top band and then adding that adding another color so you have three. Oh, you got to pull it down. Mine looks disastrous. Mine looks too good. It's going to be fine as soon as you have it. But you're walking in. I see a shit look like this. No, buddy, I got it down pat. Yeah, wait till you get to your desired zone. Mine is the underwear. Mine is the underwear. Mine is the underwear. Do you have a figure eight? You have to have that. Mine is terrible. Are some of you at a point where you have length on your ring? Okay, when you get to the end or you achieve the desired length for your band, you're going to take the very last rubber band, keep looping them into the middle until there's only one band across, and you're going to take the C-clip that's in your bag, attach it to the last rubber band, take the C-clip and attach it, and then attach it to the very first rubber band in your series. So, it's not to wear it out.
So you loop it around to your very beginning rubber band. You don't have to make it very long because they do have stretch <laughs> and they can fit on your finger. So based on this simple presentation, you can see that some of you were successful with making a rubber band ring based on your exposures. Your exposures were a video, a handout. You also had step-by-step -step instructions, demonstration, and assistance. That's a lot of the ways that we help our students in the classroom with learning a specific skill set. Some of you were able to complete it, some of you were not. BJ is now going to talk about the phases of procedural learning. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hope we're all having a good time over here. Are we? Yeah. 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 All right. Um, I'm here to talk about the phases that are involved in procedural learning, and these phases help develop and execute um, a skill. So the first phase here is a cognitive phase. So what happened over here? Let's take a moment. Uh, you want to learn a skill that is making a rubber band ring. So your senses are coming in contact with the skill. So a lot of attention is involved and it could be frustrating for some of us because we may not be successful. All right? A lot of investment on time, energy by the learner is required over here. And if I can take you back to my first guitar lessons, uh, this was pretty much similar. They were asking me to hold the guitar in a certain way, uh, sit in a specific posture, keep the thumb which never lined up parallel to the strings, and on top of it I had to look at the notes that I'm playing and strum it in a certain way. And the music that came out was pretty much, you could guess it right, right? It was something like this. And how easy is it to give up and move on to something else? Maybe easier, maybe difficult, but cognitive phase is the first phase which involves a lot of time and energy, and it's all about persistence from there on. It involves practice and repetition, and with practice and repetition, what happens? It takes us, a learner, to the next phase, which is the associative phase. So a lot of things are happening in associative phase with practice and repetition, I realize I don't want to sit anymore. We drop away those inefficient means, uh, those inefficient practices, and what works for me, what doesn't work for me. Right? So in associative phase, for me, sitting didn't work. My thumb could never rest parallel to the string. So, but practice was there. Practice. There's some of the notes where, no, it didn't work, but practice, repetition, practice, repetition. This led me to the mastery of a skill. That takes a learner to the third phase of procedural learning, which is autonomous phase. So mastery in the sense, I can finally look at the audience, probably afford a smile, walk around, <laughs> still play, and this is a trick that comes out back of your hand. It's subconscious, I pull it out at any which time. I, can, I don't have to look at all the things I looked at, but the skill is learned going from the beginning senses coming in contact with the skill to mastery, long-term understanding and a love to that skill. There's a liking, there's a bond created, so that's the third phase, autonomous phase, which involves a connection between the majors and the minors, flats and the, uh, what's the other one, chops, and music is produced. So this got us thinking the team itself don't we want our students to play such wonderful music in the area of expertise that we are in? We want them to be playing such wonderful music, connect the dots, uh, learn all the notes, and that's what took us to 
the next part of it, which is why don't they remember? All right? The facts that we teach in classes, why don't they remember? I teach Mac 1105, college algebra, and also pre-calculus algebra, which is a successive course. And when you ask students, do you know quadratic formula or how to factor, they're like, what? And they have no recollection of most of the topics discussed in college algebra. There are a few who remember, which is good, but a majority of the students don't remember carry forth topics and learning successfully. Why is this happening? Maybe it's a way we are designed, and that got us thinking about about yes, please. Thank you. That got us thinking about how our memory structure is designed. So the first part of it, the first layer, is the sensory memory. So this is mainly caused due to auditory and visual. Everything that we see, everything that we hear, but luckily we don't remember everything for good reasons or bad reasons. Or uh, we don't remember everything that we hear. So with a little bit of attention, with a little bit of attention. That goes into the second layer, which is a short-term memory. So this can be related to a student who is coming into a classroom, uh, seeing the wonderful math that's written on the board. They watch the game. Uh, they kind of like it, but with a little bit of attention, it goes into their short-term memory. So that can be probably one lecture, a session, or a semester. Uh, they display a behavior. Mind you, I would like to tell you a little bit about behavior and learning. Uh, once this short-term understanding is there, they're tested out, they pass, but it decays, all right? So like the names that we remember of our students, it decays after a semester. So what makes it into the long-term learning? Um, that should be procedural skills, which means through practice and repetition, it impacts the long-term memory of the learner. So you may remember sitting next to Mr. Salik, who's wearing a red shirt, uh, 10 years from now, uh, February the 23rd, it's a Monday afternoon. Yeah, these are all facts that are involved, but then the skills, the skills come through implicit, like a subconscious act. You don't think about it, right? When there's a car cutting right in front of you, you don't think about slamming on the brakes. I don't drive, that's another reason. But that's a <laughs> some people could catch me on that. But I've seen people who drive who just slam the brake or a subconscious act which you don't have to necessarily recall and then uh, act upon it. So this is what the target is. Our audience, our students have to get into procedural learning and this is one of our marketing strategies over here to promote procedural learning. Next. At this point, uh, like how we hit a roadblock in thinking is procedural learning similar to road memorization? What's the difference though? Uh, it's a natural doubt or a question that could arise in us. But mind you, uh, procedural learning is multiple exposures. It's how, when, and eventually we are hitting upon the why. Uh, hopefully apply and create the highest form of learning, I believe. Uh, but then road memorization is a single kind of exposure. You keep repeating the tables, 12 times 11 or 12 times 12, uh, but when you reverse it and say what is 13 times 2, or, there's no application. It is not different kind of learning to apply, but procedural learning is more understanding. It's for meaningful learning, and that's what it is all about. Thank you. And over to Susie, who is going to be talking about application of procedural learning in context. Ideally, I want my nursing students to learn a skill. And today, I'm going to give the example of using a syringe. I can't tell you one day in nursing practice that I have not used a syringe. 17 years of being a nurse, I use a syringe at least once a day. However, if I'm teaching my students a skill on how to use the syringe, I also expect that they can apply that skill in context, or that they can apply that skill within scenarios. So the example of a syringe is great because I teach the students the same thing. Here are three different types of syringes. The mechanics of the syringe are all the same. They have a hub where you can attach a needle. 
they have a shaft where I can make my measurements. They have a flange where I can put my index and middle finger, middle finger, excuse me. And they have a plunger that I can push with my thumb. The mechanics are all the same for the different syringes. I teach the students how to use the syringes, how to apply the needle, how to give injections, and how to give medications IV push. I know that seems foreign for some of you, but for my medical staff, uh, my medical faculty, thank you. However, I want them to learn how to use this, but I also want them to have different scenarios where they can apply this. We provide what's called an open lab, where the students can go, there's faculty in attendance, and the students can go practice the skill. So they can move from the cognitive phase, which is learning how to use this instrument, and they could practice it in the open lab with faculty available, which would be the associative phase, so they're developing an understanding of the skill. And then we provide simulation. Within simulation, they may have an order that requires them to give half a milliliter of medication to their patient. They need to understand which syringe to use, which syringe would be appropriate, how the medication is going to be administered, if they need to apply a needle or not, so there's several components to this skill set that they need to be able to apply. So ideally, we're going from how, how to use this, to the why and when it's appropriate to use, and therefore they're attaining mastery in a skill that they can demonstrate to the faculty within simulation or within their clinical experiences. The responsibilities of learning a skill are not only for us as instructors. The student has certain responsibilities as well. We want them to understand how to perform the task and the expectation is that they will practice. We provide the task frequently enough and it occurs throughout uh, simulation, it occurs through scenarios, it occurs in their lab time. So we provide opportunities for them to practice, but their responsibility is also to practice themselves. We also want them to reason their actions. For example, they use the one milliliter syringe to pull up half a milliliter of fluid. So their actions have to be reasonable, and they need to understand not only that they need to use the one milliliter syringe, but the why to using the one milliliter syringe. And we want them to perform the desired activity plausibly or correct based on their scenario. So, for example, a month from now, the likelihood that all of you will be able to loom a rubber band ring is probably not very likely unless you take the opportunity to practice. And you need to have exposures to the rubber bands. You need to hold the rubber bands, look at them, be able to take time to practice looming in order to perform that skill set again. So I'm going to pass this on to Marcus, and he's going to talk about what's relevant for us as educators in teaching procedural learning. All right, so the teacher responsibilities. And so while some of the, some of the, um, some of the onus rests on the instructor, the teacher does have um, some responsibilities. Now, remember, as I stated earlier, there's a two-part equation when it comes to this uh, procedural learning. There's the curriculum and the approach. So the curriculum. The curriculum, I kind of use this frock mnemonic, okay? So the curriculum must be focused. The curriculum must be relevant. The research um, indicates that any information not used over the course of the time will become irrelevant to the student. So it must be relevant. It must be organized that is in, in a conducive way um, that the students can retain the information, and it must be chunked. Susie did a great job in chunking that information, um, uh, VJ as well, in chunking the information that they delivered um, because it could have been overwhelming. The approach, sorry, the approach, the approach, you have to offer a variety of practices. Um, the uh, instructor must offer a variety of experiences, and the instructor must offer a variety of exposures. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah, um, so this is interesting, especially when you consider some of the math that's being taught now in K-12 and the decrease on the focus in some of the um, importance of repeating things over and over. And so I'm just wondering about your opinion on that and how it's, how it's related and do you feel that it's um, being transferred from the conceptual phase to the other phases 
or not, do you notice an impact in your classes? And what do you think about that? Is that math specific? I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know how it would be in other fields. I just know that we've seen a lot of that in the science and math. We've seen a lot of that with the, the new math that's being taught. And I'm wondering if you experience Yes, the answer is yes, because um, that could be the missing bridge coming down to college level and not being able to retain or remember. So I'm having to train them, repeat, give them a video, uh, teach them and put them quizzes. So I'm having to do that part of it, maybe. But it'll be really helpful if they come in with such help to remember. Because these days, we don't even remember how to go home. Uh, we put it on a GPS and just drive it. So the amount of information is increasing. At the same time, there's less importance given to I need to remember. So people get to calculus and don't know quadratic formula. Uh, that's a big no. So this has to be implemented one way or the other, I feel. That's my personal opinion. I have an example from nursing that uh, is pertinent to your question. And it's, I, I had an issue with teaching. We taught, I taught a lab about interpreting arterial blood gases early in the semester. And then it continued to arise in quizzes or assessments or in simulations. And the students couldn't remember how to do it. Um, so I changed my system around a little bit last semester. And I taught a two-hour lab on simply interpreting the results. I didn't give them any context to the interpretation of the results. I basically said, these are the six steps. These are the labs that you have to look at. And it's either one of four things, respiratory or metabolic alkalosis or acidosis. That was the end of the lab. I gave them a website that they could go to where it gave them constant arterial blood gases that they can interpret. Um, then, when I taught the respiratory section of my course, I incorporated that skill that hopefully they had practiced because I gave them the ability to, and I gave them exposure to it, and I explained what it meant to have respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis, in what situations might those um, cases or might those arterial blood gas gases be present, and what are the treatments and what are the causes. So I gradually increased their exposure. Additionally, I would have one on the board when they walked into class um, early in the morning. It would be on the board for interpretation and we would do that together. I saw a huge increase in their ability to quickly interpret and look at the whole patient within simulation where they were able to say, this makes sense to what's going on with them and I know that this is the usual course of treatment for that type of disorder. So it really made a difference in my course to repeat the information and to chunk it as far as context and not teach them everything from the very first day. Any other questions?